Good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to have everybody here. I'm Newcomb Stillwell. I'm the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I couldn't be more pleased to welcome all of you here and the very many uh, people who are joining us online tonight. Uh, the Massachusetts Historical Society is a magical place. We're the uh, first historical society in America. We've been in business over 230 years. We're the steward of one of the most important collections of American historical materials in the world. Our first publication was a letter uh, of Paul Revere to our founder in response to his query as to what actually happened that night in April 1875. Since then, our collection has grown prodigiously, and it contains the records of the history of all Americans, from pilgrims and Puritans to those whose voices have not always been attended to so much by historians and those who are lovers of history. We make all of this available to the public through our library, our publications, and our events like tonight. We uh, hope you all will cherish this place and you will return for future events and support our work by becoming a member. Like uh, PBS, we need the support of viewers like you. Um, this evening we have a conversation between our own beloved president, Catherine Algar, and our esteemed guest, philanthropist David Rubenstein. Uh, Catherine is a noted historian, nonprofit leader, public history innovator. She received her PhD with distinction uh, from Yale University, and prior to coming here, uh, was the Scottheim Director of Education at the Huntington Library and a professor of history and the presidential chair of the history department at the University of California, Riverside. She's published extensively, and this evening we will be focusing on her book, Parlor Politics, in which the ladies of Washington helped build a city and a government, which won the James Broussard First Book Prize from the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic and the Northeast Popular Culture American Culture Association Award. She is joined this evening by David Rubenstein. David, um, you know, this is said about a lot of people, but in David's case, it's actually true. He's somebody who needs no introduction. He's um, currently the, he's the co-founder and chairman of the Carlisle Group, which is obviously one of the world's largest and most successful private equity firms. He is the chair of the board of the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts, the Council on Foreign Relations, the National Gallery of Art, the Economic Club of Washington, and the University of Chicago. He is also a fellow of the Harvard Corporation. He's a trustee of way too many things to mention. <laughs> he is the author of multiple books and the host of three television shows, including the American Story Conversations with Master Historians. I think it's fair to say, and I, I'm sure everyone in this room is aware of this and uh, those listening elsewhere, but I, I think, David, it's clear that more than anybody else in our generation, you've done more for the preservation and transmission of the history of all of us. And it's a great honor to have you here tonight. So, I hope you will join me in welcoming David and Catherine. Did you wake up one day as a child and said, you say, I want to be the head of the Massachusetts? Uh, <laughs> no, it didn't even happen when I first came here, which was in 1996. I was working on my dissertation, and I got one of my first fellowships here. And I do think about that time. I think, ah, oh, I could have never dreamed this would happen. And you grew up in uh, I was born in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which is outside of Philadelphia, very pretty. Um, and I, no, I didn't think about being a historian. I, I wanted to be an actor. And I came from a background where girls didn't go to college. Boys didn't go to college either, but certainly girls didn't. Um, and, and actually, I think that 
my impulse to be an artist really came from a longing for something more in the world of ideas. You know, I was a stage actress and um, I, I worked pretty extensively. Um, in fact, when I made a big life change in my life, when I was 31, I tried to resign from Actors' Equity and they wouldn't let me go. And in fact, he said, I'm not going to close out your membership, you'll be back. So apparently, I still have options. So. <laughs> Yes. My so problem was at 30, I was poor, I was an actress, and I didn't know anything about colleges and universities, but I had played Emily Dickinson, and she had gone to Mount Holyoke. And I did Wendy Wasserstein's plays, and she had gone to Mount Holyoke. So I went to Mount Holyoke, and I said, can I come to college? And they said, yes, you can. <laughs> okay. And then how did you pick Yale to go to get your PhD? Well, you know... Mount Holyoke was a revelation. This was the world of ideas that I'd longed to join. And it was at that, you know, 31, 32, I discovered I was an intellectual and I loved history. And I was standing by the mailboxes one day and the noted historian John McFarragher said, what do you want to do? And I, I just because I was challenged, I said, I, I want to be like you. I want to be a professor and write books. And he said, oh, we're well, going to need a PhD for that. And I was like, okay. And he said, so you should go to Yale. And there was something about that kind of unquestioned, like, well, then you're going to Yale. I was like, I'm going to Yale. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about your book, Parlor Politics. Is that based on your PhD thesis? At yes, Yale? yeah. And the premise of the book is that women had more influence than people thought at the time that the, our country was started. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, if I can enlarge a little bit on it. Um, so the story is of the founding generation, right? So. The American Revolution happens, and it's a re rebellion against all things monarchical, aristocracy and kings and favor, personal favors and courtiers and all that. And as everybody who saw Hamilton knows, they were all going to do something brand new. The world turned upside down. And so the founders in the late 18th century are proceeding with a theory. And the theory is called republicanism with a small r. And they were going to build um, a republic that was going to be one party with a weak executive. And they were going to depend on Republican virtue, the ability of men to put their private interests aside for the common good. And spoiler alert, that's not going to work. Uh, and so what happens in, just to set this up, what happens between 1800 and 1830 is that by the end of that time period, we end up with a two-party two democracy with a strong government and a strong presidency. And the reason it didn't fall apart is because in those years, the women of Washington built a political machine that allowed politics as usual to happen. Okay, so at the time that the country was started, um, did women have the right to vote? No, they didn't have the... Could they, uh, if they were married, could they own property in their own name? No, they were under something called coverture, which is my personal crusade to make this um, a word everybody knows. But under coverture, which we inherited from the British legal system, obviously we were British, um, held that no, a woman had no legal identity. But the women were asked their views on political issues very much? No, I would say not, no, no. In, in fact, it was considered unfeminine. Okay, so let's talk a little bit before uh, the parlor politics uh, scene is set, and what happened before we moved to Washington, the, gun the country's uh, capital was moved to Washington. In Philadelphia, uh, Martha Washington is the first first lady. Mm -hmm. Does she advise her husband on politics or any governmental matters? Does she do entertaining? What does she do in Philadelphia? So the interesting story about those years is, uh, right, revolution is won. Everybody's not going to build something, but they don't. And the problem with the revolution was all about what they were against, but now they got to build something. And so one of the things that George Washington and his circle discovered is they had no ceremonies for this new republic. They didn't know how to handle guests and people. And so um, George Washington writes to John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, and it's like, well, how are we going to do this? And they basically set up ceremonies that allow men to come in and greet the president and have access to him. And then Martha created her own ceremonies where and they were very formal, very staid, and she would she dress like a Roman matron and she would sit on a little dais and she'd be surrounded by the ladies of the court and then a lady would come in and curtsy and it was very um, decorous. And that's really the story of those years is this idea of a, seeing a need for ceremony and on then inventing them. Okay. 
Okay, so George Washington serves for eight years. He mm -hmm. then leaves. The Capitol is still in Philadelphia. Yes. But they've agreed to build the Capitol in what is now Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, John Adams becomes the president, and his well-known wife, Abigail Adams, uh, what does she do to help her husband as president? So she was, uh, Abigail was an, uh, just an astute political thinker. And had she been a man, she probably would have written the Constitution. Um, and she was interested in that. And that's why she was a great um, partner to her husband. Uh, he had a perfidious cabinet, which we can talk about. Uh, and in that, you know, in, in the lack of really advice, he turned to Abigail and she was a wonderful advisor. She was not great with the social. She didn't see the potential of what I call the unofficial, people call the social sphere. She wasn't interested in that. So she pretty much followed along with what Martha Washington had done. She wrote a famous letter uh, when uh, John Adams was at the, I guess, Second Continental Congress saying, yeah. please remember the women when you're deciding what to do. Uh, did he remember the women? Did he say that, yes, that's a good idea? So she said, remember the ladies. Um, and it's such a famous letter. In fact, I have to tell you all that we did a March Madness bracket for the most like beloved document, and I'm happy to announce that Remember the Ladies won. Um, there you go. But a lot of people are confused at what she was asking for, David, because she wasn't asking for equal rights. She was asking for coverture to be either eliminated or amended. She said all men would be tyrants if they could. And what's interesting is that John replies jokingly and basically dismisses her, it's not his finest moment, right? But what's interesting is a couple weeks later, on the eve of declaring independency, John writes a letter to James Sullivan, who's one of the great thinkers of, of you know, the founding era, and he talks about, wait a minute, why can't we do this? Why can't men without property vote? And he argues with himself in the letter. So it shows that even though he seems to dismiss Abigail's you know, sort of notions, that he's really dealing with it. And in the end, he decides that women can't have political power because they just can't. So, so uh, that famous letter, where is that letter? It is uh, two floors up. Yes. Right? Yes. You have it here? Yes. Can somebody run and get it? No, no. Just okay. <laughs> so all of the papers of the Adams family, are they yes. in the Massachusetts Historical they, Society? They, mo most of them, yes. Um, some um, papers that, of like a letters that he wrote to somebody, they have that. But what the Adamses did is they quite soon understand that they were writing for history, so they kept letter books. So we have lots and lots of his correspondence that went out. So these are the originals? Yes, absolutely. So let me ask you about that. You have the original letters. Yes. Um, why do you want to preserve the original letters? Why not say we, we can put it on a micro fish, we could put it on a digital um, computer, why do we really need to keep the originals if we know what the text says? Why keep the original? You know, I think that there's a power in authenticity. And we live often in a, a culture right now that seems a little hazy on authenticity and facts. And so um, uh, there's always uh, an argument for keeping the originals. Okay. And there's also something, too, and maybe the technology will get, we we'll see that, when you actually see um, people's writing and the ink is brown, it's, and it's brown because it faded. And you see the folds of the paper, and you, you really see that these were human beings. That you just don't get that feeling when you have a, an excellent transcription, which we also offer at the Massachusetts Historical Society, but you get the sense that these are really people. And we have, um, we have this, a copy of the Constitution with, with people crossing out stuff and amending things. And, and you look at that and you think, oh yeah, this didn't come down from Mount Sinai in stone. Somebody's sitting there like a lawyer going, oh no, that's good, oh, that's good here. And, and then you get a sense again that this was, to use a Stacey Schiff, a great improvisation. Okay, so let's move to Washington. Uh, let's do. The second, John Adams served one term as President of the United States. And at the end of the first term, Washington is sort of ready for occupancy, but not completely. But for about three months or so, uh, they moved down to Washington, the Adams moved down to Washington. Uh, what was it like there? Was it a great place welcoming them? Well, um, you know, depending on who you were, but uh, Washington City, like the Washington City in 1800 is just getting started. And one of the fun things of research is there was a kind of subgenre of reaction to Washington City where people are like, what the heck is this? Uh, because it was really planned out. 
and it was very primitive or beautiful depending on your point of view. And there's lots of stories where a visitor will come in and go, where's the city? And somebody says, you're standing in it. Um, and so the famous story we have about Abigail is she's in this big drafty president's palace or the executive mansion and um, she hangs up the laundry just because there's space there. But they're on their way out. They, they really okay. don't. The, it's really Jefferson that comes into right. Washington with the president. So presidency. they didn't do much entertainment because they were barely there. They're barely there. Um, so um, Jefferson beats Adams for the presidency, mm -hmm. and Adams not happy, and um, he actually leaves Washington before the inauguration of Jefferson. Can you imagine a president doing that? <laughs> Next question, please. All right. <laughs> All right, so Jefferson is uh, inaugurated, and unlike uh, his predecessors, he just walks to the inauguration. Very mm -hmm. simple. Uh, Jefferson is uh, a widower, mm -hmm. so he doesn't have a, uh, a uh, wife to help with various social uh, functions. So what does he do to kind of socialize and, and, and do the kind of things he would have done had he been married? Well, I, I think he had a very clear vision. This was going to be, he thought the Federalist, John Adams, we're going the wrong way. He was going to restore the Republican experiment with this virtue. That's not really going to work. Uh, so he um, wants to banish anything that's like a court. So he'd been to France, and he'd seen court life, and he'd seen the role that what he called unofficial characters, women, had played in court life. And he was determined to stop this. So he cut people. He just didn't socialize. He opened the White House on New Year's Day, and 4th of July, but there were no parties, no balls. He restricted his entertaining to very small groups that he could control of gentlemen, one party at a time, Federalists or Republicans, because he wanted to cut um, social life out of politics. So when he had his dinners, he, had, he did have dinners for yes. a few people, but he generally would have people of uh, the same party at the dinner. In other words, he didn't mix uh, Democrat, the Republicans with the Federalists, mm -hmm. is that right? Right, because he was not about uh, power building or coalition building. He was about avoiding conflict. And when you were of his party, he was there to kind of rally you. Okay. And when it was the Federalists, he was there to get information and, and, and keep an eye on what the Federalists were doing. So, so these were not fun. He had his daughter sometimes serve as uh, mm -hmm. hostess, but was that infrequent? Yeah, because she was mostly in Monticello, so she was his official hostess. Now, and he would call on Dolly Madison. Okay, he never called on Sally Hemings, right? No, no. Okay, so um, she never, there's no evidence she ever actually went to the White House, right? I, I believe that's, yeah, there's no evidence. Okay, so Dolly Madison, the wife of his Secretary of State, mm -hmm. sometimes served as a hostess? Um, you know, when I, when I wrote Parlor Politics, that was sort of the thing people would say, oh, she was, you know, Jefferson's unofficial hostess, which is true. She did preside over his table a few times. But I subsequently discovered um, that that's not the cool story. So the cool story about those Jefferson years, so we're talking 1801 to 1808, nine, uh, is that she and James get a house on F Street and they turn it into the kind of social, unofficial sp space for uh, where politics happens. So Jefferson's there in, in the dark and lonely president's palace eating his dinner alone. Um, and on the house of F Street, Dolly and James are bringing together people of both parties, uh, anybody interesting in town, the locals who had invested in Washington City, and at Dolly's table, this group of people begin to see each other as human beings and not the embodiment of evil that they're going to, officially they are, and they start to, the very, very baby steps of building a political system and a ruling class. And this is, the apotheosis of this is, that Jefferson so insults the British minister, Mr. Mary, and his wife, they refuse to dine at Jefferson's table. Now, they're diplomats, and diplomacy happens at tables. So the all-important you know, British um, policy decisions were not being made at Jefferson's tables. They were being made at Dolly's. Yeah. And the reason for the insult was that Jefferson did not escort the wife of the British ambassador? You know, Jefferson, first, he, he, you know, he hated the British. So the first insult, and this is a very famous scene, is when Anthony Mary and his wife arrive. They're sort of appalled at the state of things, but um, Anthony Mary go, goes to pay his official call, you know, the introduction, the formal introduction, and he's in, like, a big sword and a big hat, and there's ruffles and all And he shows up, and Jefferson's not there. So then um, 
James Madison's in the awkward position who's brought him to like, they go out in the hall and then the, oh, there's Jefferson and, and then Anthony Mary can't turn his back on Jefferson so they're all backing into the room together. And then he realizes that Jefferson is dressed um, in his short clothes. He's got old pants on, he's got slippers and he makes, you know, Anthony Mary's standing there making his formal address, the manager, and Jefferson's there and he's, according to some reports, he's tossing a slipper on the end of his toe. So it starts there. Right. And then when they do have a dinner party, there, you know, there are rules of precedence. He was supposed to escort, you know, Mrs. Mary, he escorts Dolly instead. Jefferson so. apparently uh, liked to, not, if not surprise people, greet people, not dressed as you might expect a president to be dressed. What was the reason for that? You know, it's a little affectation. So, you know, he had been to French courts, you know, he was a sophisticated man. But when he wanted to, he would make this sort of statement about how uh, you're not a, in a monarchy anymore, okay? So this is how we do things here. And part of it was instituting this thing he called pell-mell, which was a set of rules he came up with which meant it's free-for-all. All gentlemen should give precedence to ladies, but there's none of this courtly stuff. Okay. So it caused a lot of heart burnings, as they like to say. All right, so Jefferson serves two terms, and his uh, successor is James Madison, who yes. is married to the famous Dolly Madison. Yes, indeed. Um, how old was James Madison when he married Dolly Madison? How old was she? Um, he was about 44, and she was about 26. And she had been married before? Yes, she had married a man named John Todd, and they had uh, two children, and um, she lost John and her her baby in the yellow fever uh, epidemic in the 1790s. Okay, so she's much different than anything Washington's seen before. She's very vivacious, she likes to entertain. So how does she change the way that uh, presidents socialize? Yeah, and so I love the James and Dolly as a couple because there's such a contrast. James is a very cerebral, uh, introverted guy, uh, and she's sort of the opposite of that, but there's something deeper going on there. So James. Um, comes into the presidency and his goal for the country is unity. Unity was very important to James Madison and he worried about it all the time. And it, you know, we could talk about what unity meant on all levels, but there are all kinds of, you know, the fear was disunion. So what James Madison had was a theory, but as well about what unity was, but he gave it to Dolly to actually put it in practice. So Dolly is on the ground and she um, has the absolute impulse to bring people together in a room of all kinds and make them behave and have a good time. Now, does she dress in a very demure way? She does not, sir. No, no, no. Um, so Dolly is famous for her clothing, um, which, you know, in, in parlor politics, I propose that we look at things like clothing in a different way. It becomes a form of political analysis. So Dolly dresses not like a real queen. That's a very particular thing. But how... Americans would imagine a queen. So, decolletage, um, things that look suspiciously like tiaras, um, sumptuous fabrics, trains, feathers, and she becomes what I call the charismatic figure for her husband's administration. Because here's the thing, again, the new Americans fought everything against monarchy and aristocracy, nobody wants that, but the only vocabulary of power they had were those kinds of things like material display, uh, luxury, um, the kind of elevation of spirit, and James Madison standing there in his broadcloth was the perfect, you know, embodiment of this simplicity. But Dolly satisfied everybody's kind of aristocratic longings. And that dichotomy, this gender division of labor, is something that's so clearly illustrated in James and Dolly. And what about the turbans? Yes, and so, again, she, she couldn't walk out in a crown because that would be too much. But, you know, she has these turbans, and sometimes she would have a little something fastened to it that looks suspicious like a crown. And she could also attach feathers, which meant that in these um, events that she had, and these were called uh, squeezes, or Mrs. Madison's Wednesday nights, every single Wednesday, and they were like big modern cocktail parties, and everybody came, and you could follow the turbans, you could follow the feathers, uh, as she just like worked the room. And this was totally unlike any other kind of entertaining. Um, and in fact, she, you know, she's always famous, David, for redecorating the White House, but she didn't redecorate it as much as restructure it. So she and uh, Henry Latrobe fashioned these large rooms, and just so you get a sense of this place, 
until Dolly's White House, as it became to be known under her tenure, because people began to attach themselves to it, there was no place in Washington City where everybody could be in the room together. Not even all the members of government, let alone their families and visitors. And she created these big rooms where everybody could get together and be on their best behavior. Now, in an era where there's no social media or cell phones or things like that, uh, it was hard for people to actually know what other people thought unless they actually saw them in person. So these entertainment uh, events that she would have at the White House was the way the president and other cabinet officers could talk to members of Congress and vice versa? Yeah, I would say that there has never been before or since access to a president. So, because James Madison would stand there all night and, and greet all of these people. And the power of her, uh, I remember one time asking a historian, sort of gently, why do you think she had so many parties? And he said, oh, she liked parties. I'm like, these were regular events. So you knew as a congressperson that every Wednesday you were gonna get access to the president, to her, and to anybody you need. So if you needed to bring a constituent and sort of dazzle them, or you needed to, to find out somebody that you could talk to and maybe work something out away from the glare of the official spotlight, you could do it. And Washington understood these parties as political places where right. a lot of meat and potatoes politicking can happen. And they took advantage of it. All right. After two terms, Madison is succeeded by James Monroe, uh, yes. his Secretary of State. So does Mrs. Monroe say, I like what Dolly Madison did, I'm gonna do the same things? You know, I, th I think a couple things were happening. Mrs. Monroe was um, ill, and, and we think she might have had something like epilepsy. So she was more retiring. And she also, she and James Monroe wanted, and they called it, they wanted to put things more on a European footing of ceremony. And this represents, so this is, you know, late 18 teens, uh, early 1820s. This uh, is a turn in Washington City. Washington City is now going to become more like a European capital and it's gonna move farther away from, say, a New York or Philadelphia. But for me in parlor politics, the big story uh, is that John Quincy and Louisa Catherine Adams come to town, and they come uh, in 1817 because John Quincy's gonna be the Secretary of State, and they've come uh, after 10 years in Russia, so they haven't been around for a while, and they come with one thing in mind. They want him to be president. Um, and one of the things that I talk about as a woman's historian is, you know, why do we study women's history? And the answer is, when you look at women's work and words and lives, you, you learn things that don't add to the narrative but profoundly change it. So if you just read John Quincy's diary and letters and papers during this time, he seems like the most upright, virtuous, unambitious guy, he has scorn for people who are running for presidency, then people didn't run for presidency, but he was just very scornful. And then you read her stuff and you realize they have a campaign. They're buying stuff, they're having parties, they're st and I can talk about it, but they had a campaign in place to get him that presidency. So at the end of the election of 1824, when he makes probably what we call the corrupt bargain with Henry Clay, historians have been shocked, shocked! that this virtuous, upright man would make a political deal. But if you know what he and Louise have been doing, <laughs> you know, for seven years, it's like, yeah, yeah. So can you explain the practice that happened around that time, I guess maybe earlier, where ladies who are prominent would call on other ladies who are prominent and give them their card, and it would result in somebody feeling they had to go call on that person. How, what was that purpose for all that? So generally, this was something that was happening in cities, right? And the idea was it was how um, subordinates um, opened social relations with their superiors. So if you were new in town, uh, you would find out the prominent people, and you would go and you would leave your card, and the, the recipient of the card would decide either to return that call, which would then officially open relations, or simply invite you to things. Of course, everything's different in Washington, right? and calling becomes um, a, a political machine, and women and men do it. So in other places like New York and Boston, Charleston, men don't do the calling, but the calling is incessant, as one person said, there in Washington City, because the calling has this purpose of you know, shoring up political power, persuading people, and the, the men are calling, it's, just because men do, do something doesn't mean it's important, but it is important to say that these men are calling and doing all this calling, and they even do the calling, so they built it around the congressional day. So men and women would leave after breakfast, they would, they would call and call and call, 
And they would even on Sunday, so in, in the rest of the country, Sunday is a time for a church and sort of family activities. But the, the men of Washington City are, are in, in these calling circles because it was that important. Okay, so um, John Quincy Adams does become president of the United he States. He does. And uh, how does his wife operate at that point? You know, this is why I like the story of the running for presidency. You know, his presidency is going to be doomed. I mean, it's only been one term. And, it, it, and I learned this lesson looking at political women. You think of First Lady as the top of the peep in the job description, you know, the job. But the truth is sometimes uh, women are much more politically active in, as campaigners. And the once they get to the White House, they don't do that much. And Louisa, it wasn't as exciting. Um, and she was a good first lady. She did do a lot of entertaining, but she was sort of depressed and quiet in the White House. And, you know, they kind of concluded quietly. Okay, so John Quincy Adams is not reelected. He is not, no. He loses to a man named Andrew Jackson. Yes. Andrew Jackson's wife had died just before he was supposed to come to Washington. Can you tell us about his wife and what happened there? Yeah, well, you know, so Jackson gets elected and Washington City is nervous because he is sort of, you know, presented as this backwoods, violent guy, uh, a murderer because he dueled a lot, an adulterer, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, and, and just generally an angry and violent guy. And they're worried about him. He's, and he represents democracy, which they weren't crazy about this idea because democracy still sort of means ruled by the mob at that moment. Not crazy about it. Then they hear this news. So Rachel Jackson's m marriage and personal life had become a campaign issue. And people said terrible things about it. And really just briefly what happened was Rachel Jackson married Andrew, uh, Rachel Do uh, Donaldson married Andrew Jackson when she thought she was divorced. She wasn't. When they found out that she was still married to her first husband, they divorced and remarried. It's fine, you know. And she goes on to live a pious life. But of course it becomes this huge campaign issue by the Adams people. And so the story is that as Rachel's getting ready to come to Washington with her husband, she hears about it. So he kind of shields her from it. And she's so like appalled that she has heart attack and dies. So now Washingtonians are really scared because he is mad. He's mad at all these people that gossiped about his wife, including those women in Washington. And so he comes to Washington with a chip on his shoulder. And his official hostess is supposed to be his, um, is it is his stepson's wife? Well, it would have been his wife, but, but you know. I mean, after she died, I thought he had uh, someone else. His, was it his stepson's he, wife? Yeah, he had something like that, but something happens the, before that, right? So um, he comes to town. Um, everybody's worried. They're nervous. So they wait for his cabinet appointments. And um, very disappointed of the cabinet appointments. They're all like his friends, also like from the backwoods somewhere. Um, no men of great prominence like, you know, Webster and Clay. In fact, they call it a millennium of minnows. But what really concerns Washington, Washington, Washington City, is he has given Secretary of War to a man named John Eaton, who is a friend, quite worthy of this post. But John Eaton was married to a woman that Washingtonians knew only too well. And her name was Margaret Eaton, though she's referred to Peggy in a kind of derogatory way in the sources. And Washington and, and Margaret had had a sort of 10-year relationship with John Eaton while she was married. They were very visible. Um, Margaret's husband was off to sea a lot of the time. And there was just so much scandal. She had a terrible reputation as a sexually promiscuous woman or adulterer or whatever. And here was this um, famous um, fallen woman. By dint of her marriage, she was going to be the first lady of the cabinet. Because, right. Um, Jackson doesn't have a wife anymore. His vice president, Martin Van Buren, is unmarried. So doesn't it make sense that his good friend John Eaton and his wife, who Jackson, by the way, also knows and, and really loves, is now going to be at the head of society. So we have an adulterer, immoral woman at the head of society. And all hell breaks loose. So what happens is um, people in his own cabinet refuse to meet with her. Is that right? You know, it's not their place to it. It's their lady folk that say that. So... Uh, in, in, in before, Dolly Madison's events and Louisa Catherine's events were about cohesion. They were about bringing people together, building consensus. Um, you know, it, they had a very positive effect. The ladies of uh, this cabinet did the opposite. They made it into a very divided effect. So they snubbed her at balls. She wasn't invited to things. Their parlors closed. So 
this is a very interesting moment in my book. It's the last chapter. So through the book, I've been um, convincing you about this political machine that the ladies of Washington are building, right? And um, sometimes when a machine runs really well, it kind of like purrs invisibly. Right. But I'm, I'm finding out, you know, that it, it's working. When we get to the, what we call the Eaton Affair, it was great for me because the whole machine breaks down and then we see in its dysfunction how crucial it is. And just to jump ahead a little bit in the tale, what happens is once the social machine in um, Washington breaks down, all politics stop. Everybody's at loggerheads. They don't know how to break this tension because the, the men of the cabinet are saying, you can't force my wives. And then the cabinet resigns or is resigned. So imagine this. You're out in the hinterland. You don't know any of this going on. And you hear in the newspaper that the cabinet has been dissolved by this man that you fear might be a tyrant or an autocrat. So uh, the tradition of shunning people that commit adultery in Washington, is that continued? <laughs> oh, there's so, I'd like to open that up to the audience. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, no. so uh, Andrew Jackson has a complicated social life, I guess, when he's president of the United States. So let's talk about the summary of all this. And in, in the women um, that we've talked about, what was their role? Was their role to kind of ease the, 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 the skids of politics and kind of make it easier for, for the men to talk more about politics? Or were they to, supposed to bring in information back to their husbands about what somebody else's husband thought? What were they really doing to ease the kind of political uh, operations in Washington? So this is, well, this is, the, this, this is a story full of ironies. Um, so the irony is, as it turns out, in a baby republic or democracy, you need exactly the kind of face-to-face -face relations that are the hallmark of courts. And the reason the, the Republican experiment from the founders is gonna work is they got rid of that. But what these women did, and the answer to your question is yes to all of that, but they started building the structures of government. So for instance, one of the things that's really important in politics is patronage. And patronage, which I'm gonna to explain to an audience in Massachusetts, is the awarding of um, poli you know, political loyalty. Political supporters are rewarded with you know, money and jobs and you know, plum stuff. And that's how you actually build a political system. And it sounds corrupt, but the truth is you also really want to have your friends around and you do want to support them. And in fact, the reason that John Adams had that terrible cabinet was he was trying to be super virtuous and not seem like he was giving away stuff to his friends and his cabinet hated him, just to put a not too fine a point out. Now the problem with patronage, it is the hallmark of courts. And these official men who need this structure building function can't do it. So for a very short window of time, uh, to preserve the Republican purity of their menfolk, the women are out there doing the influence peddling, doing the patronage, giving away jobs, fulfilling, uh, making connections between Washington and constituents, and building a structure of government that is going to allow the government to continue. And that's one thing they do. Material display is also a, a power of courts. And they, they will then use material display um, in, in a way that, again, that their husbands can't do. So the irony is in this new world that's supposed to be so different from the old, the women borrow these monarchical practices in order to build the structures. Now, they build it for something they don't know is coming, and that's democracy. And if I can give you one more irony, when they've built this structure that will hold power by the time democracy comes in the 1820s, and that becomes our ruling style, democracy, democracy then shuts all those avenues of power to elite white women. Um, because it, it, um, it elevates all white men over all women. So Cokie Roberts is, uh, was a late uh, television journalist who wrote some books similar to yours, maybe to some extent you helped her or worked on it. Uh, did you ever do any research with her or did you ever talk to her about this area, era because she, she, her books were somewhat similar to parlor politics? Yeah, well first personally I just have to say that she, she she was such a good friend of mine, and I miss her a lot. And she was a great friend of the society. She did a lot of her work here. Um, but you know, thinking about Koki and our, our work together, um, sort of uncovered a, a dynamic uh, that reflects in some way what we're doing here at the Historical Society. So here at the Historical Society, we, we, we really have this unbeatable combination with this fabulous collection. We also have historical expertise deep in our staff and in our larger scholarly community, the people with, we give fellowships to. But we also have a real commitment to sharing that expertise and that collection right. with the public. 
And when you look at Koki and me, I mean, I was the scholar. And my book, while excellent, is, um, is pretty detailed and pretty, it's, you know, I'm building an argument layer upon layer. I tried to make it accessible, sometimes even funny, but it's, it's something. And my work maybe would reach a small group of people. We, I needed a Koki Roberts to come in, see the worth of my work and say, oh, I'm gonna take this, I'm a great writer, which she is, and I'm Koki Roberts. And so suddenly, millions of people know about women's history and American women's history because they've read Koki Roberts. Um, yeah, and I, th I think about David McCullen the same way, David coming here to do his book on John Adams. David came with such an eagerness to learn and was so humble, and he's like, hey, I'm a biographer, but I don't know anything about the 18th century, and it's probably pretty different. And so, you know, there were scholarly books published about John Adams, but there was no David, you know, David McCullough took that and, and, and again was that bridge between the really good research and accessibility to the public. So if you could have a dinner with uh, Dolly Madison, what would you like to ask her? Um, can I have one with Abigail Adams, please? I just uh, would have a much more, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, the thing with Dolly is she created such an indelible character that um, there were times, she, I, I think she was very, um, it was like a, a shield was up. She had a public persona, and she was not going to get past that. And there are times in the sources where somebody will get a glimpse of that persona kind of like sagging a little bit. You know, she was a re Dolly Madison was a real person, and she was angry and depressed and, you know, sad and, you know, whatever, but she never showed that. And I think it would be really hard now to have a dinner with her and expect anything other than this kind of like surface right. graciousness. But Abigail Adams, we would get to it right away. <laughs> We would get to it right away. Well, um, we have some time for some questions yes, from here. Yes, I think here. we do. Uh, questions? I see a hand right back there. I see a big hand. First of all, thank you, Catherine. This has been wonderful. I'm Judith Kalor. I'm the owner of History at Play, and I, I portray Dolly Madison. And I wanted to ask you a question about whether you can think of any other first family, perhaps maybe uh, with exception of the current first family, the sitting president, who had a child that was so perhaps destructive to their reputation. Uh, I saw you nodding back there when I was talking about Dolly's persona. So look, that was a loaded question. It would be hard to find a worse son than Payne Todd. So that we always call him the aptly named Payne. So we were talking about this earlier. It's funny how presidents and often powerful accomplished people don't, aren't great parents. And so Dolly did have this son, and he was a ne'er-do-well, and a wastrel and gambler, and he basically, you know, the Madisons ended up losing Montpelier, probably largely due to him, so he's a terrible disappointment. Um, and really the problem was that Dolly, for, you know, she could not tell him no, and James Madison, again, brilliant guy, not a good stepfather. So um, if you can win by being the worst, Payne Todd was the worst. Right. Okay, another question right here. Huh? There's a mic. One second. There's a mic. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, John Quincy Adams' wife, Louisa, was it the true love of his life? Um, you know about the woman he supposedly loved in Newburyport, Mar Mass? In New well, uh, she's in Newburyport, so pretty there. Mary Frazee? Yeah. Is that right, Sarah? Frazier. Frazier. Yeah, you know... Um, so my question kind of yes. was like, were they, were they a great team together, or was it an arranged marriage? No, no, um, they, it was def, you know, so he had an early love. We've all had those, come on. Um, there was definitely an attraction, um, but they were complicated people. And um, one of the things they had in common was, um, and this was an Adams family trait, an absolute denial of ambition and scorn of ambition while being incredibly ambitious. And she was the perfect political wife because she could, she was good. I mean, uh, sort of getting supporters, getting votes for her husband. And he both needed her to do it, wanted her to do it, and hated that she did it. So I'm going to just say it's complicated, you know. But in the end, you know, they've had a 50-year marriage. Yeah. So um, now since we're in Massachusetts, I own, own a home in Massachusetts, and my children went to school here, so I sort of feel close to the place. I, uh, let me tell you two uh, Massachusetts history stories, uh, <laughs> if I could. Uh, I started a program a number of years ago to educate members of Congress about American history, which yeah. seems like a good idea, <laughs> since they're making the laws. 
And the idea was to interview great historians in front of members of Congress, and I hosted dinner once a month in front of only members of Congress at the Library of Congress. And I've had David McCullough and other great historians there. But I thought it would be a good idea, maybe, to let the members of Congress know how the Supreme Court works. So I asked the Chief Justice uh, if I could interview him. And he's a Harvard graduate, Harvard Law School graduate, as we know. And uh, so in interviewing him, I said to the Chief Justice, uh, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, did you always want to be Chief Justice of the United States? And he said, well, not really. I said, well, did you want to be a judge? Well, not really. Well, did you want to be a lawyer? Well, not really. Well, what did you want to be when you were growing up? I only cared about one thing, American history. I wanted to be an American history uh, professor, and that's all I cared about. And my father said, John, you'll starve to death as an American history professor. There's no right. money in it. And John said, but Dad, I don't care about money. I just really love American history. That's all I care about. So sure enough, he went to Harvard, and he majored in American history. Coming back from, uh, from Indiana, where he was, grew, grew up, in his, I think his junior year, he came back and he landed at Logan Airport, gets in to the cab and says, can you take me to Cambridge? And the cab driver said, well, uh, are you a student at Harvard? Yes, I am. What are you majoring in? I'm majoring in American history. The cab driver said, well, when I was a student at Harvard, that's what I majored in also. <laughs> um, so John did change. Uh, I think he regrets it. So I'll tell you one more Harvard story. So. Um, some of you are probably familiar with the Kennedy School, and I've been involved with it for a while. And uh, at the Kennedy School, um, there's a John F. Kennedy Jr. forum uh, named in honor of uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. And there's a rule there that if you want to speak there, and obviously a lot of people like to speak in front of that uh, prestigious forum, you have to answer questions from students. So uh, a number of years ago, um, the late Mikhail Gorbachev, after he left, uh, being the president of the Soviet Union, was on a speaking tour in the United States, and he didn't really speak English or understand English that well, but his daughter was a, a translator. And so he gave his little speech at the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, and, um, and, I, and, I, and he was a very smart man and very quick-witted. So some student, after he finished the speech, said, I have a question for you, Mr. Gorbachev. What is it? Well, um, how would history be different? How would the world have been different if Nikita Khrushchev had been assassinated on November 22, 1963, and not John Kennedy. And without missing a beat, Gorbachev said, well, obviously, you know, you can never know exactly how history would change, but I can tell you one thing for certain, Aristotle Onassis would not have married Mrs. Khrushchev. <laughs> All right, David. You have changed the tone of this evening, so... Um, <laughs> But listen, let me, let me ask you a question. Okay. Um, so I was, uh, I was a little bit thrown when you asked me about, the real, you know, about why save the document, okay. and you were just being puckish with me because you're a collector of documents. Right. Can you talk a little bit about either how you got started or what that collection means to you? Um, I, I didn't set out to be a collector of historic documents. It, like many things in life, it happened by serendipity. What actually happened is I was coming back from London uh, one night, and I said I live in Washington, so, but I was going to New York. And I was going through my mail that had piled up, and I saw that I had been invited to a viewing that evening in, uh, in New York at, of the Magna Carta. And I wasn't an English history expert, but I knew the Magna Carta was pretty important. It actually was the document that not only gave certain rights to the barons, but later other people, but it was actually the inspiration for many of the charters that we had in our, in our colonies, because many of the charters we have in our colonies were written by English schol legal scholars, and they put in that you have the rights of Englishmen, the rights of the Magna Carta. So I was intrigued, so I went to see it, and it was at Sotheby's. And a very clever um, archivist, I got there late, said, well, you should know, our curator, I should say, um, she said, uh, this is going to be auctioned off tomorrow. There are 17 extant copies. In other words, different versions, 1215, 1217, so forth. And the final version was actually in 1297. That was the only one that went into effect. The famous one that you're probably all familiar with, that King John put his uh, uh, seal on. He was illiterate, so he couldn't write his name. Um, that was in Runnymede, and he actually abrogated it within two weeks because he had said in that one that the barons could overrule him. A, a group of 25 barons could overrule uh, the, king, the king, and, and so the pope said, wait a second, if you can be overruled, and the king was under the pope at that time, 
um, maybe somebody will think that I could be overruled. So I don't like that. I'm going to excommunicate you if you don't get out of that agreement. So he, he got out of it. He then went to war with the barons. He died in the war. His eight-year-old son became the, the king under a regent. And ultimately, another Magna Carta was issued. But this particular one was said to be one of the 17 extant copies. The other 15 are in British institutions. One is in the Australian Parliament. And this one was in a family's possession for 500 years, a wealthy family. But they went land poor in the early 1980s. Uh, Ross Perot heard about that the, the fact that they were thinking of selling it, and he sent his lawyer over to negotiate the purchase of this Magna Carta. Uh, his lawyer, Tom Luce, uh, negotiated the purchase for, I don't know, a million and a half dollars or something in 1984, I think it was, early 1980s. And he rolled it up in a tube and went back through British Customs, and British Customs said to Mr. Luce, what's in that? Uh, that uh, tube. And he said, oh, it's the Magna Carta. And they, they thought it was a joke. So let him go through. And uh, so he put it on display at the National Archives for a while. Finally, he decided to put it up for sale. And the curator told me, very clever, uh, that it will probably be sold to somebody outside the United States. I know who the likely bidders are. And she told me at the time, one was from Russia, one was from Saudi Arabia, and one was from South Africa. Now, I don't know if that was true or not, but it sounded like it was going to leave the country. So I just resolved to go back and try to buy it and keep it in the country. And I didn't want to tell people because it sounds presumptuous to say I'm going to go buy the Magna Carta tomorrow. And I didn't tell my children. They'd say, how much less money might this mean for us? I don't know. So I went back the next night. I went back to Washington. I came back. And I get there. And I hadn't been to Sotheby's before. So I, um, they, I said, OK, where do I sit to bid? And they said, well, you, know, you go in this little room here so nobody can see you. And so you start bidding. And if you've ever been to these things, you know, they start bidding. And eventually, the person on the phone says, well, don't you want to bid? Don't you want to bid? I, well, I'm listening. I'm listening. And then finally, they said, well, if you don't bid soon, you'll be, you'll be missing it. And so I said, OK, here's my bid. And the next thing I know, they said, sold. It was the only bid. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so they came in to see me. And they said, who are you? We, we've never seen you before. And um, you have the money for this? And uh, I said, yeah. They said, well, you can slip out the side door, and nobody will ever know who, who bought it. Or you can tell these 100 reporters there uh, who you are and what you're going to do with it. So I said, I, I don't mind telling people. So I, I went out and said, look, I'm going to put it on permanent display forever uh, at the National Archives where it is now. And um, that I was just doing it as a down payment on my obligation to give back to the country for my good fortune. And so I began the process. And I went that night to dinner at the Citicorp president's house, Chuck Prince. I said, I'm sorry I'm late. I just bought the Magna Carta. <laughs> and I said, oh, sure, sure. And, and the next day, it was on the front page of the New York Times, and he called me and said, I'm sorry, I thought you were joking. Nobody ever come to my house before and actually bought the Magna Carta. So I, I, I began uh, getting emails saying, well, if you want a Magna Carta, I have one. Or I, people, <laughs> so I, I said, no, I don't want to corner the market on Magna Cartas. But I, I started buying other historic documents. Yeah. I own now, I think, uh, nine or 10 copies of, the, of stone copies of the Declaration of Independence, which is the perfect replica that was made in 1823. And I put them all on display. Um, places where people can see them. I have no documents in my houses or anything like that. Everything is on display so people can see them. So why do I do it? And to answer your question, here's the answer. The human brain has evolved enormously over the last 400,000 years since we, as all Homo sapiens, um, have evolved. But it hasn't evolved so much so, such that if you see something that's an original, it's, it will be the same as if you see it on a computer slide. We don't need, why do we preserve the Declaration of Independence? We know what the words are. Why preserve the Magna Carta? We know what the words are. Why preserve the Abigail Adams uh, letters? We know what the words are. Just put on a computer slide and anybody can look at it anytime they want. But there's a difference between actually seeing the original and seeing the computer slide. And the reason is this, because the brain hasn't yet evolved to the point where seeing the computer slide is the same. If you're going to see the original, most likely, as you prepare for it, you're going to read about it, most likely. When you go there and see the original, you're going to have a curator, no doubt, tell you about it. And when you leave, you're most likely going to read more about it. And therefore, you're more likely to be educated about that document than you would have been if you just saw it on a computer slide, pushed a button, it goes on the next computer slide. So the reason to preserve these things is not only because there's a certain sense that preserving the past enables us to avoid the mistakes of the past, but also humans, I think, will learn more about uh, history by seeing the originals. The same as I preserved a lot of historic buildings, the Washington Monument, yes. the Jefferson Memorial, Lincoln Memorial, a whole variety of them. Because if, if there are, it's a much better experience, people will go see these things. And if they go see these things, they might learn more about American history. One of the problems we have with American history, as we all know, is we don't teach that much about it, American history anymore. Uh, you can graduate from almost any college in the United States as a history major and not be a, have to take an American history course. 
And you can almost graduate from any college in the country without having to take an American history course. But for example, today, um, if you are anybody here a naturalized American citizen, anybody in this room? Okay. A naturalized American citizen um, has to take a citizenship test. And we've gone through many different versions of it. But a citizenship test now is there are 100 potential questions you study for, and you have to take 10, pass 10 of them. Or you, you get 10 of them of the 100 you're asked. There are things like how many branches of the federal government are there and so forth. Um, and you have to take, pass six out of the 10. And 91% of the people that take that test pass, 91%. Um, and so, um, you know, you might say, and actually, if you're 65 or older, they tell you exactly which 10 questions you're going to get. So, you know, you might say it's easy, but the same test was given a few years ago to uh, several million Americans who were born in this country. And as you might expect where I'm going, in, in 49 out of 50 states, a majority of citizens couldn't pass the basic citizenship test that foreign applicants to our country have, have to pass and do pass. And the only state where a bare majority uh, was able to pass the test was Vermont, which is a great state. But um, so it's sad that we don't know that much about American history. And you know, in a recent survey, two thirds of Americans could not name the three branches of government. And um, you, know, you get other examples of this. I mean, there, you know, 40 percent of Americans in another survey uh, thought that Dwight Eisenhower was a general during the Civil War. Um, things like that. So, you know, we just don't know that much. And the reason we should know more is the theory about history is if you don't know the past, you're condemned to relive it, a famous statement by George Santayana. Um, so that's why I preserve documents, if I can, just try to help educate people in my little way. Oh, thank you so thank you. much. So, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so any, any more questions anybody we, has? We might have a question from online. Here's oh, one. oh, there's a person in the line. There's an actual person. A, You guys, this was so interesting, and um, I agree with you, Mr. Rubenstein. There's a lot of stuff I didn't know until I became an adult and started to do my own research. And so, my question is for kind of both of you um, as far as Abigail Adams, who's also a, a hero of mine, would you say that she was an activist in her time, in her own way? And if I could just uh, second part, and then uh -huh. okay, because um, I read once that she um, took her young son, John Quincy, to a hilltop to watch the Battle of Bunker Hill from afar. And later her son wrote in a letter that he witnessed his mother's tears um, over the loss of Joseph Warren, who was their friend and physician. So my question is, do you think that if Abigail Adams was alive today, that she would advocate for having the Battle of Bunker Hill, which is the first official US Army battle listed on the National Register? Because currently it is not and it's not in the state register either. Thank you. So I'll, I'll answer part of that question because you actually were going to something interesting. You know, I, I, I have this work about these women, and I, I tell you, I convince you, I hope, that they, they would do a lot of politicking and then building of government, nation building, all that. And the irony, though, and this would be the answer to your question about Abigail, they would have been horrified if you pointed out that what they were doing was politics. They didn't have the word feminist, but they would be horrified they would tell you they were doing this under a sort of cloak of denial. They say, I am just a good wife and mother, and that young man is such a good young man to his sister, I'm going to get him a job. Um, in other words, they were doing the politicking not from, uh, they were not trailblazers, they were not, you know, again, not feminists or radicals. They just um, did their politics under this veil of gender. Uh, and because they were covered in that way, they got a lot done. Um, I don't know, what do you think about the Bunker Hill thing? That's kind of shocking. Which Bunker Hill thing? Well, that it's not on the National Register. I, I'm, that is, oh, that, I, um, well, I don't know that, it, what, I didn't know that, but I, I recently, I, there was an auction, and uh, at the auction, I bought something from Bunker Hill. It turns out that the, the uh, list of visitors uh, had been stolen. Apparently. Oh right, yes. And so there was an auction, and I I bought it, and I gave it to the Bunker Hill, oh, I guess, thank you. Session, because now somebody had stolen it. But um, I didn't know that. Um, I I uh, I am involved a bit in Bunker Hill and some uh, historic uh, historic renovation and some housing projects there. But I didn't know about that. Yeah. Well, listen, that clock isn't that beautiful clock there. Just lets us know um, we're going to probably wrap this up. 
Everybody, thank you so much for coming out on a yeah, Sunday thank night. Thank you when it's all cold and rainy. David, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for a great conversation.